Hello, everybody. Welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Hamweavers Guild of America. My name is Kathy Group. I am the Advertising Manager for HGA, and I get to be your host today. I want to thank our sponsor today. It is Peters Valley School of Craft. And if you're not familiar with them, they offer wonderful classes. If you're looking for a getaway, kind of rural, where you can just go and do your craft, if you want to be in a fiber class, take weaving, and they have so much more, check out Peters Valley School of Craft. Wonderful setup they have there. So thank you, Peters Valley. We appreciate it. We will take questions as always at the end of the program, the last 15 minutes. Please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. We love your comments in the chat, but I can't always see them if they're if you put it in there and you don't put it in the Q&A. Um, today, I'm excited to welcome Karen Baker. Karen is an ethnographic fiber artist and documentarian. Karen has been weaving and knitting for nine years. She designs ethnically handcrafted textiles, accessories, and rugs using natural and organic fibers and materials. Karen is searching the um, is researching contributions of patterns and techniques of the African American weavers before the Great Migration for the type of her type the fiber and textile design. She integrates their techniques into her own artwork. Karen is completing a documentary on the oral history and narratives uncovered in her research as part of her Doctor of Design candidate at North Carolina State University. She's the founder of Fiber with a Cause, which we will talk about some today, and the 2023 DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Artist Fellow. She sits on the Surface Design Association Board of Directors and the Equity, Access, and Integration Committee. Hi, Karen. Hey, Kathy. How you Welcome. doing? Welcome. <laughs> We're so no, excited too. you're here. Me too. Me too. Right. Always ready to talk about this work. So oh, <laughs> I'm excited. This is great. Yeah. Um, first question is, what is your favorite tea? So this is a great one. The, the textile and tea together is just everything um, to me. Um, but I am a big, some people say ru rubos or rooibos. That Whoa. is my favorite tea, but I am quickly a girl that goes to Earl Grey too. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing like a little variety. In your that's life. right. That's right. <laughs> well, tell us more about how you got started in fiber. That's a great question. I got started in fiber probably about the age of 12. My mother taught me to crochet and I fell in love with it. I really did. It, it then led me to sewing, you know, as well. And then you know, dropped off the craft, you know, after a while. And then I was in graduate school at Savannah College of Art and Design and had a creativity coach while I was at uh, Savannah. And she was like, what is it that you would love to re-engage with, you know? And I was like, I love to crochet. And so I picked it back up and here I am fast forwarding, you know, really like 12 years later, you know, when she told me to pick it up, and, and and pursuing a doctorate in this area, I would have never known. Huh. That's wonderful. Because I have to tell you, when I was in college and I was at a, you know, a, a liberal arts college mm -hmm. and taking an art degree, mm -hmm. you know, if I had said crochet, they would have, you know, run me out on a rail. Man, mm -hmm. And I'm so glad to see that they embrace fiber arts and they gave you that pathway. That's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it really has been an amazing journey. I mean, it just was offering me so much peace, you know, during that time in graduate school. And, you know, at 12, you don't know really the peace. <laughs> you didn't know anything is breaking to you. So it was just really fascinating to me, you know, what mm -hmm. it was giving to me. And, and um, I was like, you know, this is something that I see a long journey for. Yeah. We're going to talk more about that journey, but first I want to start with these two pieces. On the left um, is a rug, and on the right is a piece of, uh, is a picture of you taking a piece off the loom. Um, what do you think ignited your passion for weaving? How did you go from crochet and into weaving? Yeah, it was very interesting. I met a master Ghanaian weaver and got a chance to be exposed to his work, and as he talked through the process of weaving and the patterns and the history um, of Ghana, it was so fascinating to me and exciting um, to me. And I was like, this is something 
that I see being the next phase, you know, of, of being a fiber artist. So I then looked for classes, you know, in order to learn more about it. And I uh, found art space, which is where I have studio space at and, and do a lot of my weaving as well, too. And that put me on my journey is, is, is him telling me about his work and showing me the level of detail that mm -hmm. was put behind it in, a, in addition to the history. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how one encounter, whether it's a person, a thing, an event, can just really change your direction in life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It really did. I don't even think he knows. So he just, you know. Oh, hope you're watching. Hope you're yes, watching. yes, yes. Yeah. But it was really, you know, that that ignited something that I was like interested in. But then it just like made me more curious and wanted to explore it and wanted to learn it. And he was making his own looms as well, too. So that wow. was exciting. And so, yeah, so that was the thing that really pushed me into weaving. Oh, that's amazing. Well, the other thing that you're very involved in is that you're researching the history of the African-American weavers. And I would imagine it's very difficult to find this information. I mean, do you ever get discouraged or frustrated in trying to find some of this documentation? Yeah, I have. I think the first year that I really started was the hardest year um, because not really knowing where to go and um, not having much guidance or support of knowing where to go, meaning that people had not had the question asked. That's what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. um, and then along that journey, the, curi the same curiosity I had, other people had the same curiosity. Um, I was at George Washington at the time getting my MFA in social practice. And my advisor was like, okay, I'm just as determined as you to find this information. <laughs> you know, she's like, so where should we go? And that time, you know, we were looking the traditional way, you know, of looking at articles, trying to find it and, you know, just turning up with a wall. And she was like, I think we're going to have to go to slave narratives. She said, I think that's where we're going to have to go to find it. And that was the first open door was mm -hmm. a slave narrative where, where the person discussed weaving and dyeing and, and, and her clothing and why her clothing was so beautiful. You know, it's because of that. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and then that opened up more slave narratives as well that put me on that journey um, of finding more information. And I've had to, it's always, I'm always digging, you know, trying to go through the back of a bibliography to see if there's any information through there. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, even when I stumbled upon the work of W.E.D. Du Bois and his mm -hmm. Paris exhibition, he was you know, photographing Black life and talked about the Warren Mill Company that was the first African-American owned mill. And that's because he just shot a photo of them and I stumbled upon the photo, which led me down the path to find out more about him. So that's the way the journey has been, Kat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very exciting. Oh, I'd, I'd love to be like your assistant and just follow how you do this. I need one. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was reading about your research, I was, and it may be the obvious thing, but it really struck me that there's the personal history of the weaver that you're exploring and following and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, what their life was like, how they felt about their work, yeah. that sort of thing. But then there's also, and this comes from the weaver side of me, right. there's also the weaving history, like what kind of looms did they use? How did right. they document their work? Yeah. Was there a hierarchy or an apprenticeship? So how do you sort out these different aspects? Do you glomp them all together? How do you do that? That's a that's a great, great question, because I've had to uh, break them apart, you know, because mm -hmm. when I when I started to try to figure out the the patterns initially was my thing. What patterns um, mm -hmm. have they contributed to that we may be using and we don't know? And a lot of it has been very hard to find artifacts and, and patterns are inclusive of that, because during that time of being enslaved, slave codes made it so you couldn't read, write, you know, or write anything down. Couldn't do that. So to actually write a pattern down could lead to death. It could lead to punishment. So the only pattern that I found, and it literally is about that big, was um, two gentlemen who were enslaved by George Washington before he was president. And they kept a little piece about that wide that they hold. 
And that was the only, and it's not clear to read. Like, I don't think you can really duplicate it, mm -hmm. uh, but it is the only piece that I've been able to find. And that was found. And the reason it was found was because he had to keep books of his um, importing that he was doing of linen and silk and things like that. And that little piece was being held, but that has been the hardest part. And so when I was like, why am I having such a hard time finding artifacts? And even the museums that I was asking, you know, not being able to find anything in their collections, I had to look at slave codes. And I was like, what was happening in that time period that didn't allow people to write anything down and actually save that history in some way? So yeah, yeah. Well, who knew that a, a law back then would impact, you know, years later in so many different ways. In so many so do, you, ways. do you think they just passed it down verbally to... Yeah, I think they yeah. passed it down verbally and through practice. Yeah. I think it was through practice because you had some plantations, and we're talking about particularly the North Carolina, South Carolina, some Virginia, that, you know, there would be 300 people weaving in one place at a time. And wow. so it was a practice of learning by, you know, the memory and the doing that was allowing people to, to be able to do that. And they did have apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. apprenticeships I found newspaper ads where they were requesting African-American young girls between the age of 12 and 14 to be an apprentice in weaving so that was also occurring as well to treat teach the trade mm -hmm. um during that time period as well so I mean you talk it has been absolutely fascinating um to actually find this type of information as well too um what people don't know is Harriet Tubman was taught to weave when she was seven years old Really? Yeah, she was taught to weave when she was seven years old. She was sent off to her master's house to help with weaving. And she talks about hating it. She hated it. Oh. She was like, she's like, I don't know if my little fingers were too little. I don't know what was going on. And it's a very small paragraph in her huge story. But she talked about trying to learn to weave, frustrated by the process of weaving and, and asked for another responsibility or work in her, in her years. But she was like seven, eight years old when she started to weave. Oh, I can't imagine doing anything like that, Summer. Me either. <laughs> Me either at all. And I say, you know, it was a good thing that she was able to say, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I was able to button at seven or eight years old. Exactly. But to learn to weave at seven yeah. or eight. But yeah, yeah, yeah. She's one historical figure that I've found as well. Yeah. Oh, your work's so wonderful. I'm so glad you're doing this. Well, let me jump from that to um, fiber with the cause. Yeah. Um, would you explain to everybody what that is? And if you would tell a little bit how it got started. Yeah, well, fiber with the cause got started because of my own work. You know, it was because, you know, I was looking, there, there are a lot of um, fiber artists, textile artists who are, are, are the, we history is embedded in their work, whichever uh -huh. history they're choosing to, to follow. And it was also, how do I create a movement where people view weaving as a luxury? That they view it as not just, because you know, I kept, people kept you know, coming up with this, it's a hobby, it's your grandmother's thing, it's not. People have a career you know, in weaving and it was a historical career when I looked at African-Americans contribution in weaving. So I was like, Fiber with a Cause has to be on a mission to bring awareness to the fact that this is something of importance. It has historical reference, it has cultural reference, and that we should be valuing it, just like the fine art that you put on your wall, you know? And then in that time, how can we ensure that if there's training or opportunities that need to be forwarded, we become that platform mm -hmm. for people to do that. And so that's the journey that we're on now, me and the board who, who I'm very grateful for, are on the journey to the light, really lift up textile and fiber artists and put them in a place that people view it as is a valuable vital career to 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 the to the really the workforce um and looking at it that way so I don't want to see another textile school close yeah you know, I don't want to see another craft school close I want to see a part of what we actually do so that's fiber with the cause yeah well we have a couple of images I think Mandy don't we um and, and uh, because it's not just teaching about weaving, right? No. You have all kinds of aspects. And I got these pictures because part of it was uh, farming, right? Is that yeah. part of your fiber with a cause? It is because, you know, when I started the work, you know, cotton has such a terrible history. You know, yes. when you talk about African-American history of those of African descent. 
And it was like, you know, I, I want to know what it's like to grow cotton. You know, I, I want to know what that process is and really looking at sustainability and the use of organic cotton, I wanted to know. So I enlisted a, a, a urban farmer, a Black woman who owns her own farm here in D.C., and she had not grown it either. But thank you to her for like, I'm going to try. <laughs> we're going to try to grow cotton. So we've been growing brown and green cotton. This is our second season of doing so. And the very first try, we were able to produce what you see. Um, and so wow. this was, I mean, you talking about beyond excited <laughs> when I saw this actually come to fruition. So we've grown cotton, we've grown indigo, um, some other dye plants as well too. And that's another part of Fiber with the Cause. I was like, I want to have artists have access to this. You know, um, I want to be able to have them come and pick this, take it and use it in their work. So we're committed to making this absolutely free to artists to be able to get these fibers that are coming off of this farm. Now, who was who's, who owns the farm? So uh, Samaria is the owner of the farm. The farm is called Juniper Garden. Uh -huh. And um, I, you know, definitely want to say she uses the process of George Washington Carver. So she uses the process that he used when he was growing and helping farmers back during his time. She uses that process. So when I came to her, she was like, and I told her about George Washington Carver being a textile artist. She was fascinated, you know, and she was like, well, we use his process to grow the fruits and vegetables that we have here on the farm. She's, I was like, well, let's try it and see, because I know he was a textile artist and he dyed and created dyes and colors and things like that. So and the process worked. It worked. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, well, it you the thing that struck me when I was reading your history and and all the things that you're involved in, it just seemed like you have combined history, artwork, and economics through this program that you have. Yeah. So I was curious when I was reading this, I thought, which came first? Were you more concerned about the art, about the economics, about the history? And then did that one take you to the next one and that one to the next one? Or how did those three come about? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the art was first. Um, was it? Okay. Me. Yeah, I think as, as an artist, that was the first. And then the history was intriguing to me. I kept saying to myself, why am I so drawn to this loom? Why am I so drawn to this loom? And I keep hearing other a geographical histories that I think are super important. Mm -hmm. I said, but I'm wondering where this other history is. So that was the next step for me. The economics came in for me really with someone who sits on the advisory of my thesis. Um, her mm -hmm. specialty is circular economies and she's a weaver. And so that was, oh, a, really? yeah. So that was, you know, she did her PhD in that way, um, bringing circular economy into textile. And so when she was the one who really started to say to me, you should really look at this because when you talk about um, the Warren manufacturing mill for, from um, Coleman, that is economics, you know? Um, and how did he do it? What was going on during that time period that allowed him to be a wealthy African-American man to purchase a mill, you yeah. know, in 1896? Yeah. You know, and to maintain it. And he was dedicated, he had 300 African-American workers in his mill. And so how did he do that during that time period, which was a very sensitive time period? And so that's when economics really started to come in for me and really has also shaped, again, what I spoke with about Fiber with the Cause, mm -hmm. this future of work, you know, mm -hmm. and how does textile and fiber play into this future of work? You know, as you and I both know, it's, it's a billion dollar business, you know? And how do we ensure that artists and designers are able to be profitable, you know, as they embark on this in a full-time practice? So yeah, economics was the third piece really that has come recently, but it's been the most fascinating piece, I think, out of anything, because it has impacted everything else. You know, economics impacts everything else. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 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 For good or for bad. That's oh, yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm always amazed at your different approaches. And this next piece that we're going to show is a linen rug that you wove. And you did it to show how heavy and uncomfortable the clothing was for slaves working in the fields. Yeah. And there's so much you can tell us about that. And I, I really hope you can share some of this. Now, the cloth, 
this act of making this cloth and showing it to people, I loved it because it took it from a fact on paper and made it something that people could touch and understand. And it changes my point of view about how miserable that must have been. So could you talk some more about this? Yeah, so it was interesting because when I was looking at um, the the historical time period, I was in the probably the 1700s, so looking at the historical time period, because a lot of people have written from African-American history and African history about slave clothing. And so when I was looking at it and trying to understand slave clothing to go deeper into the textile side of it, it there were laws in place that did not allow those enslaved to wear anything that was comfortable. It literally stated that in South Carolina's a code stated they couldn't wear anything was comfortable. It had to be like non-breathable in our language now. It had to be heavy. And one thing that they had to wear was linen and wool. It was combined together. So I'm thinking in the South, South Carolina, mm. underneath that heat, picking cotton in that type of uh, uh, fabric. I was like, this had to be absolutely miserable. So at the end of the day, I was like, okay, so... How can I, one, I wanted to touch it with my hands. That was the first thing. I wanted to touch it with my hands, see the weight of it and how it felt. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm going to have, I had the wool yarn made for it. And then I bought linen as well from um, a, a, a local yarn place, um, actually in Philadelphia. And I said, okay, so I'm going to combine this. But then I said, how, what type of uh, work was, techniques could have been used during that time period in? And so I found a process called Lindsay Woolsey, which is warp over wet. And so I decided to use that process, create the pattern, but use that technique in order to create this rug. And so you talk about emotion. It makes me emotional now. When I held it, I was like, can I imagine wearing this on my back in this level of heat hmm. and not being allowed to be any way comfortable so that's why I created this piece um and it's it's called Lindsay Woolsey 1735 and it's dedicated to that you know those enslaved wearing it during that cold that was impressed on them in 1735 mm. that's just amazing I just I cannot imagine that I appreciate the heart emojis too <laughs> I know I know I mean I just assumed and again you know I, my ignorance was, you know, it was probably some lightweight cotton, you know, something comfortable. I would have never imagined. That. I would have too. I, I, and I really don't view it as ignorance. It's just like, you, you know, as a, as a, as a human being with any level of kindness, you would say that would be what probably people would wear, particularly in South yeah. Carolina where cotton was heavily grown, you know, that yeah, there wouldn't yeah. have been this set out it, you know, way of making sure that a certain type of clothing was actually worn, but it, but it was, yeah. Well, the, one of the other big facts that I read in your work, um, or, or learning about you and reading about you was that, and I never thought about this before, is the knowledge and the science that the slaves brought, um, to this country on how to grow indigo. Correct. And more importantly, how to adapt it, because, right. You know, it's not native to this country. No. And that's amazing that that knowledge came and was unacknowledged. You know, right. we did not acknowledge what came with these slaves and that they made the crops work. Correct. Um, so I'm my understanding this is also part of your research, right? Yeah, it is. You know, indigo has a, a long history <laughs> and and, you know, a lot of people use indigo. Indigo has, to me, become very Game very popular over the pandemic. I mean, people, you saw people talk about it more and not that they weren't already engaged in using that dye, but um, it incre increased the slave trade here in America because slaves were being brought over to grow indigo. And because, you know, when it was set out to do it, there wasn't a knowledge. So like you said, it wasn't native to here. People were failing, you know, and you, if you grow indigo, you know that it has like two seasons, July, September, that you can grow it. So if you miss it, you're waiting a whole nother year. So if you're using it as a commodity, yeah. that's not going to work. You know, that's not going to work. You're not going to be profitable. So they were being brought over in order to grow indigo. So I always say, you talk about scientists, innovators, you know, agriculturalist, that's what they were, you know, and my thing is give credit there because otherwise 
you, th we wouldn't know anything about how to grow indigo here. We wouldn't be able to know that it was pushing past rice. You know, it was pushing past things like sugar and it pushed past cotton. And so that type of history, I was fortunate enough to talk to someone who was a master in indigo, um, Khabibi Ajanku, and I thank her oh. because she <laughs> filled me in like on her journey of what she actually um, had, had uncovered about this particular history. And then it led me down to start to look further. And I was like, you know, the, the credit that needs to be given to those who were brought here against their will to be able to grow in that way. Cause you always hear cotton, you know but you don't hear enough about indigo and its history uh, within that time period as well. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you have got an increase. You've had an interesting journey. You've had an incredible journey. <laughs> and one of the things that I was so struck by is all of the different avenues you've gone down. Um, but somehow they they all come back together. Um, you know, the political science that you studied, the um, all the way to your doctorate and all the things in between. And they seem to all work well together, um, kind of like building blocks or the pieces of what you're doing now. Uh, again, going back to your organization or your doctorate or whatever. Yeah, I think that it's all led me here. You know, because initially, like anything, anyone you set out on a new journey, you're like, okay, am I going to lose everything that I've already done? Or is it mm -hmm. important to the work that I'm doing now? And so, you know, the political science laid the foundation, you know, for, for the historical aspect of uh, the intrigue and the curiosity that I have right now. And then, you know, dealing with design in, in that facet and understanding how to do ethnography and how to uh, do observation and and really how to research um, in that manner has all led to here. And like I said, I would have never known. <laughs> you told me, oh yeah, you're gonna be a weaver and you're gonna be, you know, studying your doctorate. I'd have been like, really? <laughs> I would have been really thrown off, you know, by the whole process, but. It has completely been fulfilling. And I'm, you know, I, I know it's a long journey because I'm really trying to uncover this work, you know, and really like the opportunity now to talk about it. I'm just always excited to do that because I'm forever learning and bringing something new, you know, finding out something new, you know, it's really a different way of I'm having to research, you know, it's not a traditional way that I'm able to research in order to find what I'm finding. But yeah, the journey has led here for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think about how, and that's changing, but like when I was in college, you, it was linear, right? Yeah, yep. You start here, you go here, you know, you get your degree and then you go get your job. And did you ever either personally or from other people get kind of grief or people going, you know, can't you make up your mind what you want to do? Or you wasted all that time in political science and now you're reading. Did you ever get that kind of grief? Oh, yeah, I did. Oh, that's uh -huh. too bad. Yeah, 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 constantly. <laughs> and it's so true that it, it made you where you are today. That's it wonderful. Has. It has. And, you know, it's really taken people like you, you know, to say to me, let me show you how this is all impacting and this work is going to be a 360 for you. You know, that it has been important um, on this journey and looking at it as a, as a journey because, it took me a minute to even tell people that I was weaving and about this work because I didn't want that judgment. I'm gonna be honest. You know, I was, you know, oh, are you trying right. something else? No, it's not something else. <laughs> <laughs> and when you get that degree, what kind of job will you get? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I was an art major. You know, I got oh, a lot of that. Yeah. And yeah. what are you going to do with that degree uh -huh. when you get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really You're interesting. You're going to be our, our superhero, our poster child. For. <laughs> you never know. You never know. You know, I always say, Kathy, if people would start to look at art as an industry mm -hmm. and then where you check the box, what industry are you in? Oh, I'm in art. You know, we say about finance, we say about accounting, we say it about business. You know, if we would start to say that art is an industry, mm -hmm. you know, then I think people would start to view, and I think it goes back to the economic conversation, that people wouldn't be saying, oh, you're not going to make any money because you're an artist. You know, that's or, not going to be gonna profitable. Teach? Right, exactly. Are you going to be a grade school teacher and teach art? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay, this is kind of off, but I love this. I, I saw you talking about this on a, a podcast or something mm -hmm. where you said, 
that you're looking for a mill. I am, I am looking for a mill. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that's where the, that's that's part of the 360 and the economics. So I think the Coleman manufacturing is what made me say, mm, I want a mill. I was like, has there been an African-American woman who's owned a mill? I can't find one right now. So I was like, hmm, I don't have a problem being the first. <laughs> I don't all right, have a folks, problem. All right, folks, you heard it here first. You're going to know the first African-American woman owning a mill. And you, you saw it here before it happened. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was like, you know, I found a Black woman who owned a, a tea mill. She owned a mill and made it into a tea house. But I was like, have African-American women with all that has been contributed been able to see that particular side of it, you know? So I was like, okay, we're going to set out to do that. I don't know when that's going to happen, but it's going to happen. <laughs> I'll be interested to hear what kind of feedback you get after the show's over. Yes. <laughs> and I got a deal for you. I've got this mill. <laughs> I'm with it. <laughs> the more I read about you, I kept trying to think of, and I don't mean to pigeonhole you, but I was trying to think, you know, are you, are you an artist? Are you an activist? Are you a historian? So what do you think of yourself? Do you think of yourself as more of an artist or an activist, a historian? economic? That's a good question. Um, I use the word artivism. So it's artist and activism combined. Yeah, that's the word that I use. Because I was like, I can't let go of one or the other and I can't choose, you know? And I think, you know, with the combination of the two, it, it supports the history, mm -hmm. you know, of everything as well too. So yeah, that's the way that, that I see it, you know? Because I was like, if I, I don't think that I could choose both, you know, one or the other, I need both in my life. At this uh -huh. point. So yeah, that, that's what I say is artivism. Yeah, I like that word. I like that word. And somebody has a book out by that title. I don't remember where I saw it, but mm. I like that. Is that something that you would teach? You know, it's interesting because at Adelphi University, they have an artivism program. Really? Yeah, they do. They do. I recently talked to them as well. And it was birthed to two women in that program who um, birthed that program out of their M.A., as their capstone project. And they are finishing up their fifth semester now. And their focus is artivism. That's their focus. So um, yeah, so it's coming to be in the academic and higher education field as well too. So yeah, and so I could absolutely see myself teaching that for sure. And people understanding that journey because I think it's a journey when you combine the two um, together, yeah. I think we need to get you to come on Spinning and Weaving Week and talk about that more. Oh, what is artivism right. and how do you do your own artivism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That because it be is good. a what is. It is a what is. And the why is it important? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And I, it sounds like it has to be on a very personal level. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's not I like think, you can say, oh, everybody's going to do this. You've got to figure yeah. out your own. Yeah, I think you have to figure out meaning, you mm -hmm. know, and what the meaning is behind the work that you're doing. And then from there, you'll start to move down whichever path you choose because history is going to play a part into it mm -hmm. um and usually a lot of times when people are art of this they want to unclose discover recover you know um some type of historical impact that art has made within a culture you know you find that a lot so yeah yeah so what's next for you Woo, that's a good question um <laughs> Um, I see a book <laughs> in your future. You said that before. So. <laughs> <laughs> I want to read it. I want you to write a book. And there's so many topics you can write a book about. I'll read them all. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kathy. I was like, you know, I, I started on a journey in 2021, January, taking the work and, and producing a documentary um, because I was big on my work being able to reach community. I was like, you know, I'm getting this doctorate and it's really out of support for uh, improving my skills and being able to deliver this work and being able to really uncover the work, you know, and I knew that a doctorate would be the, the next level and the level to be able to do that. But I was like, in order for me to be able to impact, you know, um, beyond the African-American community, really textile and fiber to understand the importance, it has to be something visual you know, that people can see. And I know film is the most visual way that people oh. can see it. 
So, you know, I started to embark on, on the documentary and um, it's about not about 80% done. It's about 80% done. So we, we're in the process now of the scholars and the historians being part of the documentary. But um, I am really excited about it. Um, I, I, I think that it will be, people will feel the emotion of, of the work and um, learn so much about what has actually happened. We have the narratives in there that have, they're reenacted. Um, so I have actors reenacting the narratives um, as well. And I think they did an amazing job. So um, yeah, and then, you know, like I said, Kabibi Ajanku was in there as well. And Mary Madison, I interviewed her as well too. And Maybell Bennett, who's been a teacher for 25 years. So, you know, I wanted, I want people to hear people's story, you know, and how it's impacted them. And the more they know about this work, the better we can ensure that it's accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I hope you'll keep us informed about it and yes. when it's ready and how people can see it, because we would really like to help get the word out and uh, appreciate that. so people can see it and know how to find it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Right. I appreciate it. <laughs> sure. Well, why don't we do some questions? How's okay. That? Sounds We've great. got questions. All right. All right. Um, oh, this is from, oh, this is from Nancy Feynman. Hi, Nancy. Just wanted to say, um, they, oh, she was just thanking us all for textiles and tea. Thanks, Nancy. That was nice of you. Uh, Deborah, thank you for your talk and your work. May I ask, you mentioned getting information from the slave narrative. And I'm wondering, where did you find this? I imagine that churches may be a source. Oh, that's a good question. So I found the slave narrative from the Federal Writers Project. So the Federal Writers Project did... Um, a series of uh, volumes really on uh, slave narratives where they interviewed um, various people um, around the 19, I think it was like 1936, but most of the people that were enslaved were enslaved about 1856 to about 1876. Uh -huh. And that's where the slave narratives were. The fortunate thing for me is that um, Mary Madison wrote a book called Slave, um, Re slave, slave Weavers Remember. And in that, she did a year and a half worth of work wow. of pulling those slave narratives out of the Federal Writers Project and putting it into a book about that big. And I was able to stumble upon the book and use some of those narratives while cross-referencing them because those narratives are now housed in the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So those were the narratives. I love the book too, Jennifer. <laughs> hey, I just saw that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Mary, Mary is amazing. So that was the, the thing that was allowing me to, and I again, I'm grateful to her because she saved me some work of trying to figure out where these narratives were going to be housed. And so I was able to pull from that and, and start me on the journey of, of where to, you know, to hear the conversation of what had actually happened. And if people aren't familiar with the Federal Writers Project, Zora Neale Hurston was one of the big players in the um, Federal Writers Project. And um, they continue to pull it on and, and it's still very active. And a lot of people are really in historian, anthropologist, you know, ethnographists, you know, use the work as well to understand that time period. So, yeah. Uh, Margie wants to know, does Philadelphia play a part in this history? That's a good question. I haven't stumbled upon much in Philadelphia. I haven't even mm -hmm. stumbled upon much in D.C., where I'm actually huh. located yet. Um, a lot of information has really been housed in the um, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia um, area. A lot mm -hmm. of information has been housed. So I'm actually trying to work my way north to figure out what was, at, was there any information housed at that time? So, because if you think about it, and that's one reason I initially started on the journey, I was like, what period will I start in? Mm -hmm. I decided to start before the Great Migration because after the Great Migration is when you see more tailoring and sewing and the weaving starts to disappear. So that's probably where you'll see more of North you know, of the Philadelphia coming into place and things like that. So I'm really trying to see if the North took any part in it when we deal with before the Great Migration. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, Michaela McIntosh, she is out of the Charleston area and she says that um, there are ledgers from the 1700s and 1800s that show that they bought fabric from England and had the slaves make up their own clothing and it was cotton cloth. 
And that she also, I knew this would happen. She says, try the American Spinnery Mill in Central South Carolina. It might be for sale. Oh, good. <laughs> I knew somebody would come up with a, with a mill. Oh, okay. Send me that chat piece, there please. You go. All right, Michaela, we're going to get that information to her. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, I knew somebody's going to ask this. Where will we be able to see the documentary? Are you to that point yet of knowing where and when? Yeah, the thing is, we're, what we're going to try to do, the, the goal is to put it through um, South uh, by Southwest. Um, the goal is to do there oh. and have it seen there and then um, try to do. So let, this, here's the technical side of it. If you stay under a short, you make it a short, I can show it to the public. If it ends up being a full length feature, I have to wait to go the film circuit before I can show it to the public. So right now the goal is to keep it as a short oh. so that I can show it to, to the public. So what I do wanna do is show it in a couple theaters mm -hmm. and while I'm still doing the film circuit, it will allow me to do that if I keep it as a short. Now, how long is a short? Usually under 50 minutes. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, good for you, good luck. <laughs> So we're hoping by February 2024. All right. Everybody's asking about where they can see it. Yeah. So February 24? Yeah, February of 2024. We want to, you know, bring it out during Black History Month. And so if, if you go Fiber with the Cause or follow Instagram, okay. we'll probably be releasing the trailer uh -huh. for it um, by November of 2023. And oh, okay. then be ready to, yeah, full release the full thing on 2024, February. Yeah. Um, now, when is uh, West by Southwest or West, whatever it's called? It's usually in uh, January, late January of okay. 2024 is when it is. Yeah. Will that be when you submit it? Is in January? No, we have to submit it in September. Oh, okay. But yeah. it would be for 24? Correct. Ooh, good luck. Yeah. yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. So we'll know if we're in. <laughs> keep us informed. Let us yes. Know. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh susan wants to know can you repeat the author of slave weavers remember mary madison okay mary madison mary madison yeah all right yeah. well somebody else was asking they kind of they sent this to me mm -hmm. what advice would you give to artists who are wanting to be an artist artist and an activist what would you say to them oh that's a really good question um i think I think it really is you finding what is drawing you in to your art. And if there is something, you know, because most people who are artists, there's an injustice that they see right. um, that is taking place. So I think if there's an injustice that you see that your art can impact, I think that's the first start. Mm -hmm. And then there may be a, a, a larger journey that you take. You may start to see a gap or something you can own within that practice and that journey. Um, and I think that's what I've begun to found for myself. But initially it was like, there's an injustice in information and how can I ensure that I bring information to this injustice? And then I started to say, okay, now how does this influence my work? You know, how do I start using this in my work, which is like the Lindsay Woolsey piece, you know? So that is the thing. I think really understanding that, so. It's Madison, not Madison. M A D I S O N. The chat pops up underneath, so that's <laughs> good. I'm glad you're watching that. It's good. <laughs> yeah, it's Mary Madison. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Oop. There we go. All right. Um. Karen, I'm not sure. It's Karen LeBlanc sent in a question, and I'm not sure what it is. I'm going to read it out loud, and maybe it'll make sense to you, Karen. Okay. I'm not sure if this is relevant, but can you talk about sustainability then and now from your perspective? Oh, that's a good question, though. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that is a really good question. I think, so I'll talk about where, the way I see it now. I think that we're in a, particularly during COVID, you saw what we called fast fashion, people pushing big on slow fashion you know, and things being handmade and being concerned about where uh, fibers and textiles were coming from and, 
you know, how um, workforce um, was being used in order to produce the things that we desire in that mm -hmm. way. And so you, you saw people try to get back to what was such a high demand, fast paced moving environment. I remember sitting in on talks during um, COVID with uh, textile talks with a lot of people who were in cotton and they were saying that they were glad for the slowdown, you know, because the demand and how fast it was to keep up with just for producing a t-shirt was too much. But they were wondering, would the end user, meaning us as consumers, allow them to keep up the pace of you ask for something, I make it, and then you wait for it, right. you know? And so could we bring, keep that system sustainable? You know, would, would the public allow them to be able to do that? So I think it's sustainability in, a, in both ways of, of being okay with waiting for something to be made you know, versus it being bulk and, you know, 55 things made at one time, or will we, uh, and appreciate that um, at the same time, along with sustainability from the way that things are made and what they're made of. During that time period from what I'm finding is making things by hand was of value. You know, it was of high value going out into the woods and picking things that you were going to use to dye your cloth, you know, uh, taking your cloth to a tailor and having it sewn for you was made people's chests stick out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was of high value to be able to do that, you know? Um, you know, because it answered a question for me. If you ever look at very old photos and you see people and they say, oh, they were enslaved. They're so nicely dressed, Right. And if people would say, well, how? it was curious to me, like, how is that? That's why. Because in the narratives, they talk about the fact of the cloth being weaved and the leftovers being given to them. Oh. And then they would sew them. And then they'd have these fine clothes that they would be able to wear. And some said they often got in trouble because of wearing these fine clothes, but they were the scraps left over from weaving cloth, you mm -hmm. know, as we say, living with cloth. So that is really how I think sustainability probably is was everything um, from what I'm getting from these narratives and what I'm getting from um, the history that I'm seeing as well, too. So, yeah, I think we need to get back to that. It's almost like we're coming full circle, hopefully. I yeah, I, hopefully. I hope so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're probably like a half moon, Kathy. <laughs> baby steps, baby steps, yeah. right? <laughs> Well, someone asked this question, and I think it's a great question, is how do you take care of yourself yeah, that's a good when point. you're doing this research? I mean, it, uh, some of this is painful. Yeah, and it was. I mean, I had to step back. Um, probably around 2021, I had to step back because I was like, this is, it was taking me over emotionally, particularly reading the slave narratives. And I was like, this is, ooh, this is rough. You know, this is this is hard, you know. And so I remember a couple of times at night, like I would shed tears as I like, I am so dedicated to being able to uh, lift up the voice of my ancestors. And how am I going to do this? And that's when the documentary came to me, because I was like, how am I going to tell this story, make them proud, let their voices be heard when their voices could not be heard. But I had to step back to do that. You know, because it was emotionally taking me over. I remember talking to my advisor and I said, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. And I, she was like, why? I said, this information is, 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 is rough. It's hard. You know what I'm saying? I said, I don't remember the last time that I read slave narratives. You know, I said, but I know I got to pursue on, but I need, a little, I need to talk this out loud. You know, I need to talk this out loud. I need somebody to understand, you know, where I'm coming from. And she understood it to be in a woman of color you know, of trying to trace history and bring history. But I had to step back and pause for a second, take a breath. Um, I took a semester off before I started my doctorate too. Really? Yeah. yeah, because that's like, I know I'm about to really dive into this work even deeper. I'm gonna be pushed, you know? And so I said, let me just step back before I start into this work. And so that was the thing I had to do that was right for me to keep me healthy on this journey. Yeah. Thank you for that question. It would be wonderful Nora. to go back in time and just hold the hand of one of these weavers and say, yes. your life isn't right now. It's not fair. It's not what it should be. But I'm going to tell your story 
Yes. You know, in a few yes. hundred years, I'm going to tell your story. Wasn't that, Ooh, oh my goodness. It makes me want to cry. It does. I know. It gives yeah, me goosebumps. It, it gives does. Me goosebumps. <laughs> because what people don't know, can you imagine Kathy sitting down and weaving 28 yards of cloth in no. a day? No. I was like, go to the fabric store right now and pick up 28 yards of cloth. You're going to be like, oh my God, what do I do with all of this? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It takes maybe five yards of cloth to make a dress, you know? So at the end of the day, 21 to 28 yards, falling asleep at the loom, you know, during the day, you know, that type of thing, you know, it was, it is so fascinating to mm -hmm. me that even when they would, a, a woman who was a weaver would have a baby when she was home recovering for a little bit of time, they would bring the yarn from being spun. They would bring the, from being corded the cotton to her to spin while she was nursing and recovering in order to take it back to be put in that loom. So never stopped. Never stopped. And then it's just taken away. And it is just I mean, taken away. All the grief yeah. I go through from what little weaving yeah. I do. At least afterwards I could go, look, I mean, yeah, exactly. Here it is. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's taken away, it's sold, it's shipped, it's profited from you know, in that particular way. So, I mean, they were heroes, you know, they were heroes, yeah. you know, being able to deliver this level of work, you know, and be mothers and, you know, uh, wives and, you know, all of that in, in, encompassed in that. And, you know, it was one story where a young woman, she was talking, she's in the slave narrative, and so she's talking about sitting at the feet of her grandmother, listening to that clanking noise of a loom and that's what she remembers is mm. that clanking noise of the loom which led her to her to weaving so yeah well diane field this may be somebody you need to talk to i don't know if this is i really hope to see the short at the bantam cinema and art center in bantam connecticut next february she said this is the best textiles and tea ever from a hand weaver and a, from a sustainable litchfield committee member so Ooh. Diane, maybe you need to contact Karen and you. Yeah, can we bring it there, Diane? Yeah. Because yeah. absolutely, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, the more people that see it, the more you know what I'm saying. Because I, it, it becomes a talk, constant conversation of talk. Right. You know, right. that people are talking about. Did you know? Did you know? Well, I'm, I'm sure there's guilds that would kill to have it. So I appreciate. You know, my, my guild would love to have it. I know. So okay, okay, I appreciate uh, that. Uh, Marsha Polk said, love the perspective that Karen has presented. You're getting a lot of kudos. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, sorry, I'm saving your chat. I want to make sure you can see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are working on these topics, do you ever say, I need to stop. I want to go create something. Do you ever, I know a lot of times that's the way I, if I'm having a bad time, I just want to go make something and I feel better. Do you do that? Is that part yeah. of the way you take care of yourself? Yeah, it is. It's, it's definitely an added way. So. Um, yeah, it definitely is an added way. And it's led to the question even about sustainability because the more I've learned, you know, I got... I have paper that I'm weaving with right now. Oh, um, really? Yeah, paper yarn that I'm weaving with. And, and I'm weaving with hemp and nettle, you know, yarn as well, too. So because I was like, okay, these things were grown, you know, these things were, you know, used and, and die. And so, okay, if people are making yarn out of it, which is fascinating to me, then I'm going to go use it on a loom, you know, in that uh -huh. particular way. So it does, it ignites creativity, you know, for me. And how do I produce a piece that is different, you know, that I create a pattern, you know, and all of this I've had to learn, you know, this has been some instinctual type of effort with some of this stuff too. So, yeah. Yep. Well, I could talk to you forever, but we have Me to stop. You are today. great, Kathy. You oh, are thank amazing. you. You, you, you. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm so excited. It's nice when I talk with somebody and I know there's something to look forward to. And I am. I'm looking forward to that documentary. And then that book. That book. <laughs> yeah, you put the book on me now. I have to do the book. <laughs> You'll come back and we'll talk about the book. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much, Karen. And I encourage you all to go to her website, fiberwithacause.com. You'll learn more about Karen. You'll see all the things she's involved with. That woman gets more done in a day and I get done in a month. 
So go over there. And again, keep an eye on that uh, website and you're going to learn more about the documentary. And we're all going to be watching. We want to see uh, that documentary when it comes out. We'll have our fingers crossed for you too. Uh, we want to thank our sponsor today, um, Peters Valley School of Craft. 50 years in the making. It's a wonderful school. And I do encourage you all to go to their website and see classes that they have this summer and fall. Um, great classes. You'll, you will recognize some of the people that uh, teach there, some of the people you love and admire. Uh, we will um, have Spinning and Weaving Week, October the 2nd through the 8th. Yay! All kinds of things going on with Spinning and Weaving Week. You can, we've still got sponsorships available. There's advertising opportunity. Vendors, if you are interested, sign up and you'll be listed in the um, magazine when this information about Spinning and Weaving Week comes out. Great way to promote your business. So we're looking for those folks. Um, and then there's all kinds of events. But the big thing we're excited about are the artist tours. We've got those confirmed. And you can sign up for things starting July. Uh, here's some of our tour people. Uh, you may recognize some of these folks. Some of these folks are from Textiles and Tea because when we're interviewing them, we're looking back there at their studio going, ooh, we want to see more of that. So we're excited about some of these folks who are going to be on and talk. they're going to be uh, giving you a tour of their artist space. So again, July 5th, I believe, is when registration opens up. Go online to wespendie.org and you can learn more about these artists and their tours um, some of the things that are going to be coming up with Spinning and Weaving Week. Again, first week in October. We're so excited about that. We want to thank everybody who supports HGA and Textiles and Tea. Your membership money goes toward a little bit of what we do, but these programs like Textiles and Tea, Careers and Textiles, Spinning and Weaving Week, a lot of that is supported through uh, donations to the Fiber Trust and from uh, sponsoring textiles and tea. If you're interested in sponsoring textiles and tea, you can do that at weavespendie.org or if you want to donate to the Fiber Trust. If you've missed any of the episodes, you can watch them on uh, HGA's Facebook page. We have them all there. You can also sign up for the YouTube channel. We have HGA YouTube. If you subscribe to that, you'll get a notice when a new one has been uploaded, but you can go back and watch um, any of the past textiles and tea. All right. Next week, we have Catherine Weber. All right, you blazing shuttle people. We're going to see you next week, I hope. Um, she has her own little army that follows her. We're excited to have her here next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Karen, for coming on today. I could learn more and more from you. I'd love to talk more. And uh, I hope you'll have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for watching and happy tea.